All right, everyone, welcome to the 100 Years of Weird Tales panel. I'm Bobby Deary, I'm a pulp scholar. Several of you people probably know me. I'm the one handing out free books. And here are the other panelists. Hey, my name is, hello, my name is Dirk Gründer. I'm a, as you can hear from my crappy pronunciation, I'm from Germany, uh, located in Japan. I am a professor at uh, Gakushin Women's University in Tokyo, where I'm teaching English literature. So wrap your mind around that one. German <laughs> Okay, thank you. Does this work? Okay, good. I'm John Betancourt. I'm the uh, former editor and publisher of Weird Tales. Uh, I've been involved with it for maybe 25 years, 30 years, uh, quite a while. And um, so I know a lot about the recent history of the magazine. Okay, so 2023 marks the 100th anniversary of Weird Tales. The first issue was dated March 1923. And since then, it has gone through multiple incarnations under multiple editors and publishers. It truly is the magazine that cannot die. As of April 2023, it's seen 366 regular issues, and the May issue is going to be 367, I believe. Um, so way back when, before there was any weird tales, there was college humor. And this is the February 20, 20, 1923 issue of College Humor. And the guys that put this together were J.C. Henenberger and J.M. Lansinger. And College Humor had a winning formula, which was they got extremely cheap jokes from all these little college magazines. And then they published them very cheaply as a pulp magazine. And it sold like hotcakes. They made a lot of money, and they got real excited. So they started another pulp, and that was called Detective Tales. And the editor for that was Edwin Baird. And that went very well as well. So uh, J.C. Henneberger was a big fan of Edgar Allan Poe. And there was not, at the time, a dedicated fantasy pulp magazine. There was a couple of magazines that published fantasy fiction. There was The Black Cat, which started around 1912, and there was The Golden Argosy, or Argosy, which would publish some fantasy like Edgar Rice Burroughs, but there wasn't a dedicated horror fantasy off-trail magazine. So he made one, and that was Weird Tales. This is the Girasol Collectibles replica of the first issue. And Weird Tales under Edwin Baird had a very tumultuous first year, okay? It went through a lot of different changes in size and format. The content wasn't particularly good. They had trouble getting advertisers. And very quickly, they ran into some real funding issues. He was down about $60,000, as I recall. And uh, they did That's not adjusted for inflation. Not adjusted for inflation. Yeah, these were 1923 dollars. They, they were leaking money, and most of it they owed to the printer, because the printer would forward them credit for it, and then they'd print the magazine, send it to the distributor, and the distributor would hold all the money that would come in for three months before they sent any of the profit back, because when the distributor sent out the magazines, the newsstand, if they couldn't sell them, they'd strip off the covers and mail them back and they'd get the cover price back. So Weird Tales was in great financial trouble almost from the start. They had real identity issues, but they also had some things going for them. Uh, very early on, they attracted the notice of H.P. Lovecraft. And Edwin Baird wasn't a huge Lovecraft fan, but Henenberger was a big fan of what Lovecraft was sending in, what Lovecraft was saying about what weird fiction was and what weird fiction could be. And Henberger was also a big fan of Harry Houdini, the stage musician. And Houdini had an interest in the magazine because he saw it as another way to market himself. So they had a collaboration that started there in 1923 with Houdini had a uh, question and answer column in the magazine in addition to the regular letters column. He had three stories that were ghost written by other authors that appeared in the magazine. This is a 1923 book called Eliot's Last Legacy. It's a book of card tricks that Houdini ghost wrote. And inside there's a very rare ad 
for Weird Tales. But it's Weird Tales not as we know it today, it's Weird Tales as Houdini wanted to make it. He wanted this to be about true stories of seances and busting them up and escapes and, you know, his type of stories. But the finances caught up with them. Uh, they could not go on as they were, so they reorganized from what was Rural Publishing Company. So College Humor, Detective Tales, which by this point had been called Real Detective Tales, split off. Weird Tales become its own entity under what was then called the Popular Fiction Fantasy, uh, Popular Fiction Publishing Inc. And at that point, Edwin Baird, they decided his editorship was not enough. They, they didn't want it. They had two first readers in Indianapolis and Chicago, and they were called Otis Albert Klein, who later became an agent for Robert E. Howard, and Farnsworth Wright, who had initially been a writer for the magazine. And Wright won the editorship. Uh, Klein helped out with what would be the last issue. You see how this is so different from what we think of Weird Tales today? This is the broadsheet size. This was the last issue before Baird officially became editor. And this is a massive three-month quarterly that's got Lovecraft's ghost-ridden story for Harry Houdini and marks the end of Houdini's involvement with the magazine and just the start of a new era. And there's a wonderful little essay in here, Why Weird Tales, that Otis Albert Klein wrote because he had ghost-edited this issue. And Klein goes on to what Weird Tales was, why it worked, why it didn't work. And I always love his last statement. So Weird Tales, from its inception and will in the future, endeavor to find and publish those stories that will make their writers immortal. It will play its humble but necessary part in perpetuating those personalities that are worthy to be crowned as immortals. And that's sort of true, because what we remember about that first year of Weird Tales isn't so much the people that appeared in the paper. Uh, most of the writers in those first dozen issues or so, you don't read today. You never hear their names. You're never going to go back and say, oh, that was a classic, except for maybe a piece by Lovecraft or something. But Weird Tales in its mission to publish what other people would not publish had a niche. It had a market, and they proved it. So for Weird Tales under Editor Farnsworth Wright, I'm going to hand you off to Dirk. Okay, uh, I mean, you just said the niche thing. Um, yeah, when we talk about Weird Tales, I mean, uh, we need to make it very clear that by the time Weird Tales uh, was out, uh, there were actually no genres like fantasy, science fiction. People were talking about these Weird Tales, so, uh, and Weird Tales pretty much covered everything. And that probably was one of the reasons it drew so many people um, to itself. Then again, um, you just mentioned that uh, about uh, the writers that are forgotten. Uh, let's perhaps uh, quote what S.T. Joshi said in his biography uh, about H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, where he referred to Weird Tales as uh, the majority of what was published in Weird Tales was pretty much rubbish. And uh, let's be honest. Uh, one doesn't have to be an elitist, but there is indeed a lot of stuff where you wonder how could this, how could people really enjoy that? Let's, for example, talk about Seabury Quinn, who was one of the uh, sales uh, of the most selling authors. Uh, what was it? Ghosts being killed by being uh, with a vacuum cleaner, uh, stuff like that. I mean, okay, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, but. Um, it, when we talk about the 30s, I mean, the golden age of Weird Tales was definitely uh, when we had the three guys, Robert E. Howard, H.P. Lovecraft, and Clark Ashton Smith. And you're going to uh, get treated to something really awesome this afternoon from 1.30 on. We have this panel about the three musketeers. Um, so I leave it to these guys to talk more about them. Uh, but again, if we look about, uh, at Weird Tales in this time, uh, Again, it comes pretty much down to uh, who is nowadays being remembered. It's pretty much H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard, uh, because they were coming up with something totally new. And in case of Howard, uh, people 
enjoy it even nowadays. Uh, and let's talk about, I mean, when we compare the, them as writers, H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard, Okay, Lovecraft fans, you can kick me, but um, I would say Howard beat Lovecraft by length. Uh, so it's actually not strange to say that, Low that Howard is and was the better writer. Anyway, um, <coughs> <laughs> but what, what, what do you say? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, another thing is, um, it, Farnsworth Wright, uh, he was a great editor, and in this case, he was actually a blessing. I mean, he he helped Howard to be, uh, actually to get his make his break, and um, at the same time, uh, he also uh, was the reason that probably a lot of authors were fed up with him for not paying them, for rejecting stories. Uh, probably just to tell these authors, okay, I know uh, that I'm your main income and I can take your stuff, but I'm also in a position to take it away. And then the fact that Weird Tales was always in financial troubles, um, especially I think in the, after Howard's and Lovecraft's death, Weird Tales pretty much became often a dumpster for minor material because uh, many authors, uh, try to sell their stuff to better ones. You were just disagreeing a little bit, yes. <laughs> okay. okay, so it has to be remembered that Farnsworth Wright was editor of Weird Tales during the whole of the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, the bank that Weird Tales used went under. And it did not come back. So they lost all of their savings again. And that was a major financial difficulty that the magazine had to struggle through, and that's when they begin delaying payments. Um, Weird Tales had already been fairly on the cusp as far as other pulps, because they weren't a really big pulp. A really big pulp, the money did not come from buying the issues on the sands, it came from the advertising. If you had enough advertising, you could sell it for less than it cost to print it and still make money and still attract big names. But they could only get little rinky-dink advertisers like the Rosicrucians or, you know, books for the Anthropologist Library. It, it was really the small ads in the back of the old issues of Weird Tales are a bit of an interesting thing to go through. But when we hear about Robert E. Howard's desperate letter to Farnsworth Wright in 1936, you know, you owe me all this money, I've got bills to pay, my mother's dying. This happened because the pocketbook was tight, and that wasn't just Farnsworth Wright playing favorites, um, because he wasn't in charge of the purse strings. The one in charge of the purse strings was a guy named William Sprenger, who was the treasurer of the magazine until it changed hands in 1939. Um, so let's talk about that transition from Farnsworth Wright to the next editor, Dorothy McElroy. Now, I, I did want to add one thing to that, uh, which was Weird Tales was also hampered by not being part of a larger publisher's chain of magazines, and they would sell ads across all the magazines, not just to one particular magazine. Like you wouldn't go in and buy uh, one ad in Weird Tales, you would be buying an ad that appeared in 50 different magazines that month, and it would appear in every single one, giving you a reach in the millions instead of the you know, 80,000 that Weird Tales would reach. Um, okay, so in 1939, Weird Tales was sold, and the offices were moved from, it was originally in Indianapolis, and then they moved to Chicago, and it was in Chicago all through the 1930s. Then 1939, it was sold, and it moved to New York, where the new publisher was the same guy that wrote, that uh, published short stories, Paul. Dorothy McIlwraith was the editor of short stories, which was a general interest popular fiction magazine. And it was a fairly successful one, too. But Wright made the move from Chicago to New York with his wife and son, but he was in the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. He was had first been diagnosed with the disease in about 1921. They believe it might have come from a head injury when he was serving over in France in World War I, but you know, it's always a little speculative about that. 
but by 1939, he couldn't walk unassisted. It, it was getting really bad. And so he was fired. And there's always been some discussion about, oh, was he fired or did he retire? His letters from 1939 and early 1940 say he was fired, which is pretty rough treatment, but there you go. And it might have been the Parkinson's that attributed to some of his caginess when it came to what stories he would not would not accept. Because he very famously, he'd reject stories by H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard sometimes. And some people think, you know, he just didn't dare to publish these stories because, you know, he was very iffy about it all. But in 1939, he was fired. He uh, briefly considered creating a rival magazine. But in 1940, he went in for an operation, and he came out, he was resting at home, and he died. So that was the end of Farnsworth Wright. And, and what he left to Dorothy McGilwraith was a very different feel. When Weird Tales started out in 1923, it had no real competitors. Argosy would run the occasional fantasy piece or off-trail story, but there was no dedicated fantasy magazine. There were occasional attempts to mimic weird tales. Uh, Strange Tales of Mystery and Terror was the most famous version that ran for seven issues. And Ghost Stories was a confessional style magazine which lasted for many issues but is largely forgotten today. Uh, tales of Mystery... Yeah, Tales of Mystery and Imagination was very close to what Houdini wanted the magazine to be, but it was about another magician, Thurston. Uh, although it also published a story by Lovecraft, Cool Air. So there were some little rivals of weird tales going around, but in 1939, there was an explosion. You know, there's like nine pulp magazines came out dedicated to fantasy, sci-fi, weird stuff. And... That's when you've got uh, Mary Nadinger at Famous Fantastic Mysteries doing all the reprints, and you've got Unusual Stories started to publish, and they were publishing two cents a word when Weird Tales could only afford one cent per word. So Dorothy McGillwraith came into the market at a time when she was under a lot more competition, and a couple of her major authors namely Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard had died. Clark Ashton Smith had largely stopped writing, although she got a couple of stories from him. And she published 80 issues in the 14 years, uh, 1940 to 1954. And during that time, she managed to get some good stories because she'd get Robert Block in, she got Manly Wade Wilman in, she got Seabury Queen in, uh, Joyce Payne Brennan published stories. So, you know, it's not that there aren't good stories during that run of Weird Tales, but fans were already looking back at the Farnsworth Wright era as the golden age. And they kind of knew that the magazine was slipping a little in its standards because it was changing for the market. And you can also see that uh, August Gerleth was starting to push the Cthulhu mythos more because in 1939, he and Donald Wandry had started Arkham House, and Arkham House had found that there was a market for collections and anthologies of Weird Tales writers, at least some of them. Now, just to interrupt, by, uh, uh, one thing you mentioned uh, is uh, Dorothy McElroy. As far as I understand it, she, while she was the editor, she did not have even as much competence or permission to deal with the authors as uh, Farnsworth Wright. I think Hoffman Price mentioned it in his um, Day of, uh, Days of the Dead, where he said that she was pretty much just a uh, hired uh, hand and she had no rights to decide. She was pretty much told what she had to do. And I think in Farnsworth Wright's case, he had much more freedom actually to work independently. Um, that might actually be one of the reasons why he, his period is much more creative or appealing. Yeah, Wright had a tendency of trying to follow trends. You know, you can see in his magazines, he's not just doing the Edgar, uh, Edgar Allan Poe style stories, the ghost stories, the Lovecraft stuff. He's trying to focus on whatever people would buy. If it's weird crime, he'll publish weird crime. 
If it's science fiction, he'll publish Edmund Hamilton's Space Opera, and he would try different things. Um, in 1927, Weird Tales published its first anthology, and it was terrible. <laughs> this uh, is an original from 1927, popular fiction books, and it has four stories from the magazine's first year under Edwin Baird, one of them by right, and they're just the worst stories you could possibly pick to stuff an anthology. But the idea of an anthology had legs. People knew there were good stories in Weird Tales buried among all the draws. And the British publisher, Selwyn and Blount, in 1928, I think, started the Not at Night series, which was largely drawn from Weird Tales. There were a couple of stories from British pulps in there, but the one time they tried to do an all British version of Not at Night, it was terrible, it flopped, nobody remembers it. And uh, so there were, there was reprint potential. There were good stories in there buried among all of the really stereotypical zombies and spooks and specters and werewolf tales. But Wright would also try other things. Uh, Wright tried to create other magazines. He tried to do Oriental Stories, which ran for a good number of issues. Ten issues under Oriental Stories and another five issues under the title The Magic Carpet Magazine. He tried to get something called Strange Stories going. Robert e. Howard actually sold him a story for Strange Stories. And then there was a dispute with McFadden over the rights because McFadden had already published a magazine called True Strange Stories. So you can imagine these guys wrangling over the name rights and eventually, the magazine never got published. The story was eventually published in Weird Tales. Uh, Wright tried other things. The Wright Shakespeare Library, of which this is the only issue that they ever printed, with illustrations by Virgil Finlay. The, very nice. Yeah, Wright was a huge Shakespeare buff. He's like, ah, oh, this is cheap printing. Maybe it'll sell. It did not sell. Um, in 1933, he started getting the radio rights from the authors as well as the first serial rights because he was going to do the Weird Tales radio show. And there were radio shows that did adaptations of Weird Tales in the 30s. But again, it didn't really hit the popularity it needed to be profitable. And as he was saying, Dorothy, sorry, go ahead. Uh, are there any recordings of those uh, radio shows? Yes, there are. There are? No, not, not the ones from Weird Tales, because they oh. never existed, but the, the others were all uh, uh, available. You can probably find them on archive.org. Okay, great. Yeah, and... Did you a question about the lady that was running things, that you said she wasn't in charge? So who was in charge then? The, public, the publisher gave Dorothy McElwraith um, her orders mostly on what she could and could not spend. She did try to be a good editor for Weird Tales, but she was not as familiar with weird fiction. So like when she came on board, she tried to get her most popular authors at short stories to write stories for Weird Tales. And she stopped doing reprints because she was competing against the all reprint magazines. And she created the Weird Tales Club, which was an official fan club for Weird Tales. And she cut down on the letter section in the area because she couldn't answer all the questions. Yeah, she was a very competent editor, and she was trying to be creative within her limits, but she did not have as much creative control as probably Farnsworth Wright did. So, 1923 to 1954 was the initial run of Weird Tales, and that's a good run for a pulp magazine. Many pulp magazines never made it that many issues that long. That was right through the end of the pulp era. And then... And it, it did kind of uh, move to digest-sized format at, at its very end, but that wasn't enough to save it, unfortunately. There were also some foreign versions of Weird Tales, which we don't talk about much. There were two runs of the Canadian edition. There were 14 issues from 1935 to 1936, and then 58 issues from 1942 to 1951. And the Canadian edition's fun because there were paper restrictions during World War II, so they couldn't just bring the American pulps over the border. 
Instead, they'd send the stories and material to Canada where a local office would arrange and print the issue. So for collectors out there, some of the Canadian versions of Weird Tales are a little different from the American version. Check out the covers. Yeah. Uh, there was also three UK editions from 1942, 1946, and then 1949 to 1954. And these are all different publishers, and much the same difficulty remained as with the Canadian issues in that you couldn't just sell the American editions. They wanted a localization. And they're, co they're very collectible now, but at the time, they were competing in the big local British market for science fiction and fantasy. So they kind of didn't make the splash there as they did in the United States. Uh, all right, so when things ended in 1954, they did not pick up again until 1973. Uh, Sam Moskowitz decided to recreate Weird Tales. Now, Sam didn't, didn't just start to do this. He started out with uh, Leo Margulies had bought the rights to Weird Tales and was publishing these little paperback anthologies which were ghost edited in some cases by Moskowitz. So again, you can see that there was good stuff in Weird Tales. They realized that people like Lovecraft and Howard, they had a fandom that they could tap into that market. And they tried to. Um, the Moskowitz reprint in the 70s only lasted for four years, four issues, I'm sorry, 1973 to 1974. And then in 1982, Lynn Carter got the rights to do it, and he talked Zebra Book into recreating Weird Tales as a series of paperbacks like this one. And this is a combination of new and old new material, because this was right in the middle of the Howard boom in paperback. So there's, re there's a reprinted Howard, there's new stuff, there's Clark Ashton Smith. It was an interesting experiment. But again, money issues, you know, it was a... The, the, the real money issue was Lynn not paying anybody that he owed money to. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, no, I, I actually heard that from multiple people who he owed money to and never paid. And he was, at the very end, still trying to do a second set of four, and Robert Weinberg, who owned the rights at this point, refused to license it to him because he didn't have any expectation of being paid. So he would rather wait and find somebody better. Um, but I really want to emphasize, at this point, Weird Tales had hit a sort of legendary status in the fan community for science fiction and fandom. Okay, you started to get zines like Weird Tales in the 30s, where they would talk about all the great people that had been in there. You've got indexes to the magazine. This is an index of all the short stories in a library binding. You've got Index to the Verse. Weird Tales was very notable as being one of the few magazines that published a lot of poetry. All right, because Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, August Gillette, these were all notable poets in their own right. And you can read poetry in some of the other pulp magazines, but it didn't create a tradition. The fantastic poetry in Weird Tales did because August Droleth would publish collections of their poetry through Arkham House. And at this point, in the 1980s, I believe is where you come in. Oh, the, the issue. oh God, yeah, okay. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay, so uh, 1984, Forrest J. Ackerman and Gil Lamont managed to publish one issue from Bellafron, and then Gordon Garb edited one more, and these are probably the scarcest issues of Weird Tales outside of the early 1920s, because I think they had trouble with the printing, and then both of the distributors went bankrupt. Nobody I know ever saw one on the newsstand. Um, if you were lucky, uh, Robert Weinberg, who had a mail order book business, had ordered 500 copies and actually received them, so you could have ordered them, uh, at least the first issue, directly from him and actually expected to receive it. Um, so it was very, very, very scarce and they were immediately selling for you know, 60, 70 dollars a copy you know, on publication of a 399 magazine. That's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. 
But that is when, uh, so that's when Terminus started. Right. Um, well, Terminus is actually the successor to um, the George Sithers Amazing Stories. George Sithers was the editor of um, Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine, the, the founding editor of that. And um, when he was abruptly fired from that for interfering in the contracts process because they were trying to impose a, a horrible contract on the authors and he alerted the Science Fiction Writers of America because he had um, uh, suicidal tendencies when it came to editing. Uh, he was immediately fired and uh, was snapped up by uh, Gary Gygax and um, the Dungeons and Dragons people who always wanted to revive fantastic stories, which they actually never managed to do, but they had bought Amazing Stories, which was merged with um, Fantastic under the name Amazing. And uh, he continued that for a number of years until he again committed editorial suicide by prompting an editorial in Locust Magazine, complaining about how great the magazine was, but that it had no promotion and hence no circulation because the circulation was about 10,000. Uh, as opposed to um, Isaac Asimov's, which was over 100,000. Even though he was publishing the same authors, uh, nice format, better cover art, uh, had newsstand distribution, but no promotion. So, um, at the time Amazing fired him, um, there were three of us uh, there. I was one of the assistant editors. Daryl Schweitzer was another one of the assistant editors. And we decided we wanted to continue working together, but in partnership rather than under George. And um, this worked uh, really well in many ways when it came to Weird Tales, because we sort of formed an editorial triumvirate, because we all had different strengths. And uh, this was our very first issue. Uh, we, out of the gate, sold 14,500 copies of the first issue. Uh, we had to go back to press because demand was so good through the comic book direct distribution market that we were largely using. It um, uh, sort of vindicated him with uh, amazing stories saying, look, with a little promotion, you can sell more copies. Um, the real problem, though, was that the magazine was too expensive to produce. Uh, we were pricing it at uh, the first issue, 350 which was about the same size as a digest size magazine printed on uh, newsprint, uh, but we were on acid-free paper with a larger size and um, heavier book paper covers. So it was basically a trade paperback and probably should have been closer to seven or eight dollars a copy. Uh, when we were selling that many copies, we were of course making a little bit of money so that we were able to continue with this format for quite a while. Uh, we got maybe 10, 15, I, I don't remember how many issues. Uh, we did um, gimmicks like special authors. This is a special Jonathan Carroll issue. Uh, before we had to move to a cheaper format, you know, the eight and a half by 11, uh, thinner one. But again, uh, keeping the price low and paying the same professional rates as the large magazines, the economics just weren't there. Um, by the time, by this time I'd had to leave because I got married, moved to Newark with my wonderful wife Kim, and uh, got offered an editorial job in New York City, which I accepted, so that left George and Daryl on their own. And um, I gave them tons and tons of good advice. I suggested they try uh, cutting back on um, not so much the frequency as the, uh, the format and making it a book the way that Pulp House was doing their uh, science fiction anthologies, the Pulp Back, the Hardback Magazine. You know, they were charging $20 a copy, and I knew that there were enough people out there that if you published Weird Tales in a thousand copy edition in hardcover for $20, you would make money. And um, they were just unwilling to make this sacrifice. And uh, eventually they ran out of money and um, stopped paying Robert Weinberg, there's that name again, who immediately took back the name, and they changed the name of the magazine to Worlds of Fantasy and Horror, but they kept the giant W that looked exactly the same as Weird Tales, so that anybody who saw it would think it might be related. And this was the transition issue. Weird Tales has just become Worlds of Fantasy and Horror. The, um, this lasted four issues, let us say. It, it, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it was not the best solution. Um, ultimately, they um, sold out to Warren Lapine of DNA Publications. Um, great guy, very creative. He was running a bunch of magazines at the time, including um, his own version of Fantastic. Uh, but he started the numbering again, so it wasn't a continuation of the old one. And uh, at, uh, he had a science fiction magazine as well, and a vampire magazine, so this would be his fourth magazine. And uh, the first thing he did, of course, was talk to Robert Weinberg and get the title back. And immediately, circulation jumped by several thousand, uh, simply because the Weird Tales collectors wanted to keep buying it. And they had stopped buying Worlds of Fantasy and Horror. And then they realized that George had continued the numbering system from uh, Weird Tales in Worlds of Fantasy and Horror so that anybody who wanted a complete run of Weird Tales had to go back and buy the back issues, which I thought was <laughs> fiendishly clever at the time. So they had a boom on the back issues for a while as people tried to fill in the holes. Um, and Warren um, was uh, a good friend of mine. He still is, actually. He's still running DNA publications, uh, but he's concentrating on books these days. He ran into um, distribution problems, as Weird Tales seems to periodically do. And I helped him out by becoming a partner in the issues. At one point, I bought half the magazine from him. And um, I helped him get you know, some of the artwork, like this one by Romino Morrill for the cover, which is, I think, one of the best covers Weird Tales has had in the last 50 years. And um, it was a lot of fun being involved, but again, uh, that <coughs> $10,000 I paid for half the magazine didn't really help him that much. And a few years later, he said, John, I'm still having money problems. Would you like the whole thing? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I bought it. Um, and he told me at that time something very interesting, that his goal as publisher was not to be the last publisher, but to make sure that he would hand it on to somebody who would continue it. And um, I think we had another mini boom of uh, success because George and Daryl and I continued as uh, a new kind of editorial triumvirate with, um, with the three of us producing a number of issues again. Um, about that time, my wife relocated to Washington, D.C. for a new job, and I moved there from the Philadelphia area and um, met, made some new friends and hired some new employees. And one of them was a guy named Steve Siegel who pitched me on uh, trying to really revitalize the magazine by changing its focus and bringing in a younger, more contemporary editor. And he suggested Ann Vandermeer, who um, would go on to win Weird Tales, its, its first and only Hugo Award for uh, best semi-prosine. But she was a little more uh, au courant than a lot of the older people really wanted and took the magazine in a very drastically different direction. Um, and again, the circulation sort of vacillated a little bit up and down, uh, but it never really took off the way I was hoping it would under her. And um, several years into that, a guy named, Weird, uh, named Marvin Kay, who has been one of the great anthologists in the field in the last 30 years, uh, he produced uh, a number of books drawn from Weird Tales and other sources, including Weird Tales, the magazine that will not die. Uh, of course, because it's true. And uh, anyway, he, he told me that he had always wanted to be the editor of Weird Tales, but had never been able to, um, to work it out. And uh, eventually he came to me with a guy named John Harlatcher, uh, who was a film guy from the West Coast, and um, they pitched me on selling the magazine to them. And uh, they wanted to try and use it as a springboard to get a Weird Tales TV show. And um, so I actually sold it to them. And again, following Warren Lapine's advice, I was not the last publisher. Now John Harlatcher can be the, the next publisher, and we'll see if he gets to pass it on to somebody. But he has been quietly on the West Coast trying to pitch um, a number of projects based on Weird Tales. And um, every year or two, I hear from him saying, it's close, it's close, and it's only been 10 years. So <laughs> it's, it's Hollywood time. Uh, but anyway, they, in the meantime, they do keep producing an issue now and then just to keep the trademark alive because that's their main interest. This is one of theirs. Um, 
This was Marvin Kaye's uh, editorial debut, I think, as the editor of Weird Tales. He did a, a double cover with the logo on both sides. And uh, that made Marvin, who was a good friend, really, really happy. And um, again, you know, it, it, it's, it's all about keeping the magazine alive and going at some point. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. If they actually do get a, a TV series, I'm sure it would do great things for the circulation and they'll bump up the frequency, but right now it's being published on venture capital for magazines, as, as far as I understand, or for films, as far as I understand, just to keep the trademark alive so they can keep pitching it. What was the story on changing the lettering from the old St. John style to like, a, a, at some point, Weird Tales changed the magazine? Right, that, that was Steve Siegel trying to make it more contemporary looking. Got it. He, um, he was a very interesting guy who, incredibly creative, very visual. Um, he did some amazing book covers for us. Uh, he was our, our graphic designer mm -hmm. for maybe six, seven years. Uh, we're at Wildside Press, my company. So as of 2023, the editor is Jonathan Mayberry, and you can buy issues at weirdtales.com. And I think we've got uh, about 20 minutes left, so do we have any questions? Deuce. Yeah, uh, when you were talking about the Weird Tales Club, uh, not that it's a huge thing, but Hugh Hefner was a card carrying member. <laughs> Which he, he published lots of uh, fantasy and sci fi and horror and Playboy. Yeah, Playboy was a very important professional market for science fiction writers in the yeah, 60s, right. 70s, and 80s because they paid top dollar. And they also published some classics like William Hope Hodgson's uh, A Voice in the Night. Yeah, but yeah, Hugh Hefner loved weird fiction, science fiction, fantasy. Playboy did a lot of good work with that. I bet if you looked at the, the whole, I mean, you figure how big the club was, it was like, what, maybe a thousand members? And one of them was Hugh Hefner, so that tells you how much of a fan was. Sort of like the Velvet Underground. There weren't many people at the first shows, but every one of them went out and made a band. All right, uh, any other questions? Um, you talked about uh, trails being off, or stories being off trail, was that? Uh, off trail was a term that was occasionally used during the 20s and 30s for stories that did not fit into any other. Yeah, it was like secret code when you read the table of contents, it would say, an off-trail story, and, and that way you knew what to expect. It would be usually fantasy or horror, occasionally science fiction. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what happens uh, with the uh, original artwork from the period, like all 100 years of it, like does anything that survive for the cover art? Yeah, a lot of it went into fans' hands because you used to be able, the, the magazine would buy all rights to all the art, and you used to be able to write in, and sometimes they would, the editor would send you one of the pieces of artwork, um, or they would give it away to, at a convention. Um, that's why uh, a lot of the old-time fans had incredible collections of art. Yeah, Seabury Quinn would uh, often write to his artists asking for the art for his stories or his covers, and he'd have it framed and put on his wall. And then fans like uh, Robert H. Barlow, who's one of Robert E. Howard's correspondence would write to the writer and say, I'd like your typescript, I'd like, you know, if you've got any drafts or artwork or anything, I want it from my collection. And sometimes they'd send it to him. He did that with Robert E. Howard, but Robert E. Howard would not send him any of the artwork for his stories because he liked it too much. Uh, actually, there's tomorrow's a uh, panel about uh, artwork. You may want to go there, there's one guy, or actually all three of them know a lot, so you might want to ask that question again tomorrow. Is there an archive of like correspondence that uh, right hand with any of the authors or anything? Anywhere archived anywhere? At the university or anything? I, I don't know of one. Sam Moskowitz was the last person I know to have access to the business records of the old Weird Tales from 1954. And after he died, I think it went to his wife, and I don't know what happened to it after that. Well, a lot of his material went to auction. Just boxes and boxes of it. He had um, you know, hundreds of thousands of items in his collection. And, uh, but I imagine that probably ended up in a university somewhere, or, or should have. Yeah, 
Texas A&M. We don't know where. <laughs> Texas A&M. It's at Texas A&M. Ah, well, there you okay, go. There you go. Same school, it's collapsed. It's leftovers. Yeah. Um, I think I was first. Any other questions, please? Okay, well, Dirk, you wanted to talk about the literary legacy of Weird Tales. I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say that, that Marvin Kaye and I edited The Best of Weird Tales 1923, and we had a horrible time finding enough good material to fill a very slender book. We, we had to make some sacrifices to get one story from each issue, mm -hmm, yeah. but we did. Mm -hmm. And um, you can buy it on Amazon if you want, Best of Weird Tales 1923. And Daryl Schweitzer and I are actually working on a 1924 volume now. And at this pace, we'll have the Best of 25 probably in about 2040. Schweitzer, uh, Schweitzer is also working on a really nice edition for Centipede Press, last I heard, wasn't he? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm okay, I, I, I don't talk to him that often anymore. Okay. Yeah, but okay, we'll come back to the influence on of weird tales. Another question. You referenced Houdini and Thurston yes. earlier. What is their association with the magazine? Or? Uh, at some point, Houdini claimed to have had part ownership of Weird Tales, but as far as we can tell, that wasn't true. <laughs> what happened is that Henberger was in Chicago when Houdini was in Chicago in 1923, and they worked out a deal that Weird Tales would start promoting Houdini and that Houdini would start providing material for Weird Tales. Basically, Houdini would talk about several stories and give a synopsis, and then Henberger would assign it to one of the writers to write a story based on that, and then we think Houdini's secretary ghost wrote the uh, letters that are in some of those 1923 issues, the Houdini answering magic questions. But the most famous ghost writer for Houdini was H.P. Lovecraft with Imprisoned with the Pharaohs, which uh, was a very big deal for Lovecraft at the time because it was $100 in 1923 money. And it, it's always a funny story because Lovecraft had finished the manuscript. He had typed it all up. And then he was leaving Providence, Rhode Island to go down to New York. He was eloping to get married. And he left the typescript in the train station. And it got lost. So they get married, and they're going on their honeymoon to Philadelphia. And he has to rent a stenographer's typewriter so that she can read his manuscript and he can type it back out. And that's how they spent their honeymoon night. It, Lovecraft. This is Lovecraft. Um, Houdini, of course, did not long survive. He died the next year after a uh, performance. He had been very ill. But yeah, it was a very brief association, but a memorable one. So anybody else or? OK. Yeah, OK, coming back to the influence of Weird Tales. I mean, I'm honestly quite sure about uh, the literary influence, uh, how strong that really is. But for example, pop, on pop, popular culture, I mean, you mentioned, for example, uh, the TV thing and Hollywood thing. So how would you assess? I, I personally don't think they're going to get very far with the TV thing. Um, they were trying to do an anthology series, and really, I think the day of anthology series, like Twilight Zone, are over. People want uh, longer form narratives, preferably in 10 hour long episodes that streams, so you can watch them back to back. And anthologies don't really lend themselves to that anymore. What about the influence on EC Comics? Um, it's, that's sort of an open question. We know that a lot of the people that were writing and illustrating EC Comics read Weird Tales because they would rip off Weird Tales in the pages of those horror comics. Uh, August Durleth very famously sent, I think it was American Comics, a very nasty letter for ripping off a story called The Ormulu Clock. And there was a Lovecraft story that was ripped off without any credit in the pages of EC. And so we know they were reading these stories, and we knew they liked them because they were ripping them off and they thought they were effective horror stories. But it's hard to say if there was much beyond that, because you've got just that bit of overlap between EC Comics right up until 1954, 1955 when the uh, Senate, 
committees start on juvenile delinquency and they really start to crack down on comic books with the Comic Code Authority being formed and then EC Comics is basically legislated out of existence. Um, but yeah, you know, we don't have like a letters page from EC saying like, oh yes, we all love Weird Tales. It'd be nice if we did. Anybody? Go. Um, you mentioned Smith, Lovecraft, and Howard, but didn't Bradbury write? Ray Bradbury was in the uh, 1940s and 1950s. Yeah, he, no, he, he definitely was there. Um, there were a lot of, uh, basically the next generation writers, like uh, Henry Cutner was a major one in Weird Tales. So, um, it, it, she was, Dorothy McElroyth was trying to bring in her own stable of writers, uh, develop her own people, and you know, there, there's quite a few who would go on to have major careers. And those second generation weird tailors are sort of what we get to when we were talking about the literary influence of weird tales because most of the major writers you hear about, Robert Block, Ray Bradbury, you don't remember them for their stuff in weird tales necessarily, but for the stuff they did after. But that was all coming out of being in that weird tales milieu, you know, the Lovecraft circle. He wrote to a bunch of people, but a lot of them turned out to be really influential, like August Gerles founded his own small press publishing company. James Blish became a major editor. Robert Block wrote Psycho. But how much it's a literary influence as much as a pop culture influence is sort of an open question. Um, I don't know if you can talk about a Weird Tales literary tradition so much as a Weird Tales pop culture diaspora. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay, it was a playground for writers to try out what was working and what wasn't, what wasn't done before. And I mean, for that, Weird Tales definitely needs to be credited. So that was the place that gave them the chance to uh, actually see, okay, can I uh, really come up with these barbarians or can I, uh, uh, how far can I go with, for example, uh, risk topics? And in that respect, Weird Tales is really a great starter for these guys. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Anyone? I, I hate to open the door to what about and, and uh, give a list of author names, but I would say that Fritz Leiber was a first generation. Fritz Leiber's, uh, a lot of his fiction, his most famous stuff, such as The Fawford and Grey Mouse, did not appear in Weird Tales. It appeared in Unknown and Unknown Worlds. He did write in Weird Tales during the Lovecraft years. Um, not the Lovecraft years, but immediately thereafter. He corresponded with Lovecraft during the last years of Lovecraft's life, and Lovecraft actually commented on the first draft of the first Fawford and Grey Mouser story, Adams, Adams Gamble? Adam, yeah. Um, so yeah, there was that Lovecraftian influence, and he was published in Weird Tales, but it wasn't his famous what stuff. What fishing for is a Howard influence. Oh, um, after Robert Howard's death, there were calls for people to take up the mantle of Conan, get somebody else to write the stories. Farnsworth Wright would not do this because all the rights were owned by Dr. Howard, but he would publish sword and sorcery type stories by people like Clifford Ball and Henry Cutner, who if you've ever read his Alec of Atlantis stuff is very much in that Howardian vein. And I think Fritz Leiber was absolutely in that Howardian vein. The problem was, once Farnsworth Wright was out of the picture and Leiber was submitting to Weird Tales, Dorothy McGillerith did not want to do sword and sorcery. Um, she did not want to do it at all. She was really focused on a sort of more old-fashioned version of what she thought a Weird Tale was. So that's part of the reason, and the more money, that sent Fritz Leiber off to places like Unknown. I hope that answers your oh, question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, one last question, I think. In the 100 years of Weird Tales, um, have there been any notable legal issues with licensing, copyright, ownership, or um, anything of that sort? Non-payment of bills, particularly for the logo, <laughs> is the big one I was aware of. Um. There have always been some little issues. I'm not aware of any author that sued Weird Tales. I'm not aware of any 
acrimony against non-payment of authors against Farnsworth Wright like there was against Hugo Gernsback. But, you know, there was absolutely a legal history there as far as stuff like the Strange Stories title. Um, and there's always been questions of, right, what does Weird Tales actually own? You know, what rights do they have versus the author's rights? Because back in the day, the magazine would register the entire magazine under copyright instead of the individual authors filing for copyright. So when it came time to renew that copyright, you would need a legal entity there that could speak for Weird Tales to renew the whole contents of the magazine. That didn't always happen. And In fact, it mostly did not. Uh, I'd say that 95% of the classic issues of Weird Tales, the first 50, 54, through 54, were not renewed. There's a few scattered issues in you know, a couple years, but it, most of them were not renewed. It was up to the authors after 28 years of publication to go in and renew their work. And most of them were their estates did not. Um, so there is sort of a legal quagmire there because nobody's ever tested whether or not that whole magazine copyright is valid. I mean, most people assume that it is, but I don't think it's ever been actually, tested. Actually, uh, Project Gutenberg is testing that right now. They are on the cutting edge of claiming everything is public domain. Uh, they've been working their way not only through Weird Tales, but most of the pulp science fiction magazines of the 30s through the early 60s. And they've established, for instance, that um, Astounding, which was li largely thought to have acquired all rights and hence renewed everything uh, and then controlled it and reassigned it to the authors as needed, um, did not in fact acquire all rights. And so that most of the stories that are classics from Astounding, unless the authors renewed them, are now in the public domain. This includes uh, the Lensman stories by E. E. Doc Smith and a bunch of other things. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. I hope you enjoy Howard Days. Thank you.